this is a prologue. You should understand the way it was back then, because it is the same even now. Part one. Long ago it happened that her husband left to hunt deer before dawn, and then she got up and went to get water. Early in the morning she walked to the river when the sun came over the long red mesa. He was waiting for her that morning in the tamarack and willow beside the river. Buffalo man in buffalo leggings. Are you here already? Yes, he said. He was smiling. Because I came for you. She looked into the shallow, clear water. But where shall I put my water jar? Upside down, right here, he told her. On the river bank. Part two. You better have a damn good story, her husband said, about where you've been for the past ten months and how you explain these twin baby boys. Part three. No, that gossip isn't true. She didn't elope. She was kidnapped by that Mexican at Siama Feast. You know my daughter isn't that kind of girl. Four. It was in the summer of 1967. <laughs> TV news reported a kidnapping. Four Laguna women and three Navajo men headed north along the Rio Perco River in a red 56 Ford, and the FBI and the state police were hot on their trail of wine bottles and size 42 panties hanging in bushes and trees all along the road. We couldn't escape them, he told police later. We tried. But there were four of them, and only three of us. Five. <laughs> uh, seems like it's always happening to me. He thought he'd better check up on things, just in case. Maybe some animal was trapped in there, something like that. So he opened the door, shined his flashlight in there. And here was this man, really respected in the community always working hard, never even drunk. Well, there he was with this big fat woman, and she was married too and had 12 kids. <laughs> and there they were in the middle of winter <laughs> with no clothes on. <laughs> and this poor man who found them, he didn't know what to say. So he closed the door again, <laughs> and he went back home, and he even forgot he had to go to the toilet. <laughs> so down at Masita, they were laughing too. And they always have to say, that guy sure was taking a chance messing around with a woman as big as her. <laughs> All she'd have to do is roll over on him. <laughs> and that would be the end. <laughs> I was always given to feel, and, and it was pe by people like Anthros, to feel that, that it, to be a, a worthy human being, if, if you were coming from a Pueblo, that you should have... Uh, you should know the stories just ex as they are in the BAE. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go to those things and do what they did. And the reason, now the more I think about it, that you know, I don't have to is because, actually, I guess I really did, in a, in, a, in a funny kind of way, through all those years, I guess from the time I was as little as Kaz all the way up, hear quite a few um, stories. Somewhere along the line, I heard in what would be passed off now as rumor or gossip. I could hear through all of that, I could hear something else too in this, that, that there was a kind of um, a, a continuum or continuation, despite the fact that, that in 1930, Elsie Clues Parsons wrote off Laguna as being a lost cause and said that it had no kiva or something. And the same went going for the, for the, the in quotes, oral tradition. I guess somewhere along the line, I, I, I always loved those kinds of stories so much that the things in the BAE sort of looked dead and alien, and, and I figured, I don't know, I just, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't do anything with them anyway, even though theoretically they're supposed to have come from here, you know. All around Laguna, all around the, the different villages, and they were in their suit coats, you know, and they would go up to the door with a, you know, a turkey under one arm and a ham under the other, and they would knock on the door, you know, these guys, you know, Cam, I'm so, I'm, you know, your, your state representative from Valencia County, you know, and, uh, 
you know, and if you'll vote for me, you'll vote for me, won't you? And he said, if, if you will, you can have your choice, one of these, you know. And, uh -huh. and he said, all you have to do is just promise to vote for me. I'm, you know, and, and I'm, this is my platform, and, and, and you know, what would you like to have, you know, turkey or ham? And so the people would say, um, people would say, you know, uh, oh, well, I guess I'll have to have a turkey. And then they would, and then he said, are you going to vote for me? And they oh, oh, yes, yes. You know, and then they close the door. And they thaw it out, and it's thawed out and cooking right about that, you know, next week when it's election day. And everyone's just eating turkeys and saying, you know, laughing about how, you know, how it was they got a hold of a turkey. Yeah, this is the turkey that man, you know. That, Didn't even know that, his name. That, that Mexican man came, you know, he said, we're supposed to vote for him, you know. They eat some more and say, yeah, today, as a matter of fact, and tear off another part of it. Just laugh. Yeah. Peeped over the edge, and there they saw, off in the distance, they could see the special dancers. But right below, they saw all this picnic lunch laid out down there. And they started jumping up and down and going, oh boy, oh boy. And then one of them said, yeah, but big deal, and what good is this going to do us? Because, well, look down how far down there that is. There's no way we can get all the way back around and off this mesa and down there in time. There's no way. Coyote said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why do you think I called you guys over here? Listen, I've got this wonderful plan. Now he said, now you, you'll go over first, and he'll hold your tail in his mouth. Then I'll put his tail in my mouth. Wait a minute, now wait a minute. And then this other one, they'll hold, hold my tail, and listen what we're going to do. Do you, guys, do you guys see what we're going to do? Do you guys see what we're going to do? We're going to make a coyote chain, and we're going to go over the edge. And gradually, we'll just go down the side. See, we'll be holding each other by our tails. Isn't that a wonderful idea, he said? Look where all the Mormon houses are below the village here. We're closer to the river than, than you know, the rest of the village. I always thought there's something symbolic in about, <laughs> about that placement, sort of putting us on the fringe of, the fringe of things. So when I was a kid growing up, um, the river's really close by. Yeah, I was always really fascinated with, uh, with the river. And I loved the river very much, but I knew it was a small river and I never expected it to. I didn't make great demands upon it. I don't know, the, the river, there were always stories though, you know, I, I don't know, you just start hearing about things that, the river's the one place where things can happen that can't or won't ordinarily happen on the middle of the village, obviously, and so. What gradually happens with the river is that the river, you begin to know the river sort of simul in, in many different ways, sort of simultaneously. And it's not clear to me which comes first, um, the way the river is or, or the yellow woman stories about the river, which control, you know, which makes. I, I, I sometimes think that, that it's the yellow woman stories that makes, makes the river so seductive and, and sensual and not the way the river is that adds to the story. There was some point when I began to, to see uh, when all of those things began to come together. And, uh, and I think it was when in the writing and, I be, and uh, all of these stories and all of these things sort of began to come together and the river takes on a kind of uh, identity. It be becomes a very sort of special place. When I think now about how I've written in the stories, or like in that sort of poetry piece, storytelling, um, suddenly I realize that that my sense or my feeling of the of, of the river comes from all of these places. That the identity, um, you know, a lot of people make a mistake when they they hear me talk and they hear me laugh about about the storytelling, and I think that they they don't understand uh, if people can't listen um, to you. Uh, without you, you being pompous about it, they don't deserve to hear what you have to say anyway. But it is, is very important, and it's not just gossip, and um, those aren't just stories. Um, it's the whole basis for, for what keep the people, uh, that's what keeps the people together, is everything that they know, they know through all time about each other and about themselves.
Indian song, Survival. We went north to escape winter. Climbing pale cliffs, we paused to sleep at the river. Cold water, river cold from the north. I sink my body in the shallow, sink into sand and cold river water. You sleep in the branches of pale river willows above me. I smell you in the silver leaves, mountain lion man. Green willows aren't sweet enough to hide you. I have slept with the river, and he is warmer than any man. At sunrise, I heard ice on the cattails. Mountain lion with dark yellow eyes, you nibble moonflowers while we wait. I don't ask, why do you come on this desperation journey north? I am hunted for my feathers. I hide in spider's web, hanging in a thin gray tree above the river. In the night, I hear music, song of branches, dry leaves scraping the moon. Green spotted frogs sing to the river and I know he is waiting. Mountain lion shows me the way, paths of mountain wind climbing higher, up, up to cloudy mountain. It is only a matter of time, Indian. You can't sleep with the river forever. Smell winter and know. I swallow black mountain dirt while you catch hummingbirds, trap them with wild flowers, pollen and petals fallen from the Milky Way. You lay beside me in the sunlight, warmth around us, and you ask me if I still smell winter. Mountain forest wind travels east, and I answer, taste me, I am the wind, touch me, I am the lean gray deer running on the edge of the rainbow. <laughs>